speaking on the topic, The Ivory Tower Under the Cross of Christ, A Lutheran Approach to University Education, I give you Dr. Scott Ashman. What is the primary purpose or highest end of a university education? The question often expressed in terms of value is a contentious query in contemporary American society today. For many students, parents, business leaders, and government officials, higher education is an expressway to personal employment and economic success. In a 2012 survey of freshmen in the United States, fully 88% said that the most important reason to go to college was, quote, to be able to get a better job. 75% likewise agreed that a chief goal of a college education is to be able to make more money. Reacting against this economic careerist view, many liberal arts pedagogues counter that intellectual cultivation and contemplation of truth is education's highest end. They argue that the pursuit of truth, goodness and beauty, is an intrinsic self-sufficient good that need not be useful at all or serve any other end. Its purpose and value rests solely in itself. We see this thesis centrally argued in Mark William Roach's recent book, Why Choose the Liberal Arts. Uh, this won the Association of American Colleges and Universities 2012 Frederick W. Ness Book Award, no small award. Roach argues here that the highest end of education is intellectual contemplation, which is an enjoyable divine activity. He says, through leisure of contemplation, we abandon the contingent and engage the eternal and attain joy that does not and need not serve a purpose beyond itself. For as Roach says, the business of work serves the external purpose of giving us the conditions for leisure and repose on which the joy of contemplation, our highest end, depends. In Roach's view then, people are to live for ideas they are to live for the life of the mind, in which ideas have no less value than things. Moreover, by engaging in contemplation, not practical service, people participate in, as Roach says, the activity that most mirrors the divine and brings them nearer to God. This educational vision is also evident in John Henry Cardinal Newman's discourses on higher education called The Idea of a University. In this book, many humanists like Yaroslav Pelikan hail as the most important treatise on the idea of a university ever written in any language. Pretty all-encompassing praise. In the 19th century, utilitarians under the influence of John Locke argued that education should avoid useless disciplines like classical languages and have students only learn what is useful for their temporal callings, their jobs. Newman responded to this occupational vision of education by contrasting a liberal with a commercial education. He distinguished them by asserting the following. That alone is liberal knowledge which stands on its own pretensions, which is independent of sequel, expects no compliment, refuses to be informed by, that is, refuses to minister to, any end, or absorbed into any art, in order duly to present itself to our contemplation. The most ordinary pursuits have this specific character if they are self-sufficient and complete. They lose it when they minister to something beyond them. For Newman, then, self-sufficiency and freedom from service define the highest end of education, which is contemplation. Moreover, when people imitate the mind of Christ to know, systematize, and contemplate all things, meaning truth, they become, as Newman says, divine sons, immortal kings, gods. In what follows, we will see that Aristotle's approach grows out of a theology of God and a teleology of human life rooted in leisurely, intrinsic, personal pleasure of intellectual contemplation. We will see that this liberal approach to education offers three significant benefits for individuals, society, and the church. The benefits of cultivating truth, habits, and virtues. We will also see that this approach contains two grave problems for Christian universities that should not, but often do go, unnoticed. They are the temptations to ideolatry 
or the worship of ideas, and homo incurvatus ense, a Latin phrase meaning man turned inward on himself. Finally, by applying a theology of the cross to liberal education, we will see that Christian universities can reform this approach by preserving the pursuit of truth, habits, and virtue on the one hand, while reorienting higher education to focus on the two highest ends of life revealed in scripture, faith in Christ and love for neighbor. Now, in order to understand Aristotle's vision of education, we must first look through four windows, each of which gives us a vision of Aristotle's conception of education. He doesn't lay it all out in one place, so we have to gather and glean from various writings. Uh, his writings on the politics, or metaphysics, or Nicomachean ethics, or Protrepticus. The first window in is his theology about God. Aristotle asserts that for the cosmos to be in motion, there must be something which moves the cosmos while itself is unmoved, exists actually, and can in no way be otherwise than it is. This something is the first mover, the first principle or God, of which Aristotle postulates there are several. We won't get into how many, just many. The gods, being the unmoved movers, are what ultimately start and keep all things in motion. Moreover, the gods internally enjoy what humans can only briefly enjoy, pleasure. So what is the god's greatest pleasure? Aristotle submits that the gods are blessed and happy, and that the actions that they take up directly connect to their happiness. So what sort of actions must we assign to them, Aristotle asks. In answering this question, Aristotle immediately dismisses divine acts of justice immediately dismisses divine acts of mercy, bravery, or temperance, since these and nearly all other actions that we might want to predicate of the gods are, quote, trivial and unworthy of the gods. The only activity worthy of deity is contemplation. So the gods' activity is, as Aristotle says, thought thinking itself. Thought thinking itself. Kind of hard to get at, but you can think about it. Moreover, rational thought is the divine element that is best and most pleasant. It is the good state of happiness in which the gods always live. The second window is Aristotle's teleology of humanity, that is, his view of humanity's highest end in life. This flows directly from his theology about God. For Aristotle, happiness is the end of human nature, the goal, the purpose of human nature, because happiness is what everyone seeks itself and not for the sake of anything else. A cardinal principle for Aristotle here is that an intrinsic activity is always superior to an instrumental one because an intrinsic act is free to pursue its own self-sufficient end whereas an instrumental act is servile and merely a means to another end over there. A second cardinal principle for Aristotle is leisure. Indeed, as Aristotle says, the first principle of all action is leisure, since leisure is better than occupation and is its end. Based on these principles, Aristotle concludes that human happiness depends on our leisure from work that serves external ends since people are only busy so that they might finally enjoy leisure. So what is the intrinsic, self-sufficient, leisurely activity that gives greatest pleasure to humans? Aristotle offers us three possibilities and then works through them. The life of enjoyment, politics, and intellectual contemplation. The life of enjoyment, Aristotle admits, is pleasurable, but it is merely re the relaxing amusements of song, drink, sleep, and the like that divert people from the pain of their work so they can finally work again. Political or military life is an unleisurely activity. It seeks to achieve other ends, as noble as they may be, peace, power, honor, and happiness for oneself and others. Intellectual activity, though, is, as Aristotle says, superior in every worth and aims at no other end beyond itself and has its pleasure proper to itself as well as self-sufficiency, leisureliness, and all of the other attributes ascribed to the blessed man. So it follows for Aristotle that contemplation is the complete happiness of man, as he says, because it is an intrinsic activity free from serving other ends. 
The third window is Aristotle's view of humanity's creation. Understanding is by nature our end, Aristotle says, and the exercise of it, the final activity for the sake of which we have come into being. For every man has been made by God in order to acquire knowledge and contemplate, end quote. Indeed, the gods have put the likeness of divine contemplation in people so that they can cultivate this characteristic and achieve the quote-unquote best state of life that is most dear to the gods. The last window for us to look through is Aristotle's vision of paradise. Paradise, Aristotle says, is the leisurely place where there is need of nothing and no profit from anything, only thought and contemplation. In this utopia, the rational soul is free from bodily concerns, free from serving other ends, and can continually contemplate the truth of the universe. Moreover, by rational contemplation, people make themselves immortal like the gods. Everything exists for the sake of the mind. Everything. In this light, given that the highest end of human life is the happiness of the rational soul contemplating truth just like the gods, the question of what constitutes the highest end of education easily follows for us. Like the three paths to happiness in life, Aristotle offers three possible purposes for education, utility, excellence, higher knowledge. Students should learn of excellence, Aristotle explains, because it consists in rejoicing in loving and hating rightly. It consists in cultivating the power of forming right judgments and delighting in good dispositions and noble actions. An education in excellence, like learning music with its noble melodies and rhythms, is valuable because it properly forms character and judgment. This kind of learning is useful to civic life and prepares people for intellectually enjoying what is noble, right, and true. But while an education in excellence forms people's minds, it habituates them to pleasures, and it contributes to their mental cultivation, it cannot be the primary purpose of education because it, too, serves other ends. So the highest end of education for Aristotle is, and it has to be, intellectual activity. Contemplation is the highest end. Indeed, it is the only true end because it is a leisurely activity of free citizens that gives them pleasure, happiness, and enjoyment. It does not serve other ends. It's completely self-sufficient and valued entirely for its own sake. In conclusion, Aristotle saw education as being liberal or illiberal. If, as Aristotle says, a person learns anything for his own sake or for the sake of friends or with a view to excellence, that action will not appear illiberal because it is done freely for its own sake or for the happiness of the free, rational soul engaged in contemplation. But if done for the sake of others, as in the case of professionals and slaves, the very same action will be thought menial and servile. Clearly, for Aristotle, the primary purpose of education, as it is with life, is pursuing personal happiness by contemplating truth free from service. First, the premium that Aristotle places on pursuing the truth and its sister's goodness and beauty is golden in an age when truth is regularly sidestepped for instrumental ends that pursue wealth or jettisoned for satisfying the ideological appetites of powerful partisan groups. As Roach observes, Today we elevate an instrumental form of thinking, a means end rationality, in ways that tend to obscure what is of intrinsic value. When reflection on how to reach certain ends becomes supreme, it e easily overshadows the most basic question, which ends should I achieve to begin with? Second, Aristotle's approach cultivates academic habits that are useful, that are terribly treasured, transferable skills in life. Newman succinctly explains them in one passage this way. A liberal education gives a man a clear conscious view of his own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. It teaches him to see things as they are, to get right to the point, to disentangle a skein of thought, to detect what is sophistical, and to discard what is irrelevant. It prepares him to fill any post with credit and to master any subject with facility. These intellectual habits that Newman is alluding to here and others like them 
are still valuable today for excelling in a job and every other vocation a person has in life. As evidence of this, Roach in his book cites several studies that show that liberally educated students excel in a wide range of careers and occupationally outperform peers who earn purely professional degrees. Third, and equally valuable to a person's career and citizenship is the excellence, as Aristotle calls them, or intellectual virtues that Aristotle's approach to education supports. Arguing against those who claim that higher education is not the place to cultivate ethical character, but is solely the place for inducting students into the world of disciplinary research or training them for technical professions against this view, Roach demonstrates that virtues are constantly at play, practiced and applauded in higher education today. From Aristotle to Newman to Roach, it is evident that contemplation is elevated as humanity's highest end in education and life. That much is clear. But making the contemplation of ideas humanities tell us, that is, the self-sufficient end that is happiness itself for humanity, this ends up turning the pursuit of truth into an idol that is served for its own sake. It erects, we might say, an ivory tower temple with its own god, an idol, priests, professors, laity, students. Here, people trust in the contemplation of ideas to bring them closer to divinity and give them immortal joy, just like the prime mover God who is thought-thinking himself all the time, or the Christ who knows and contemplates all things. The Aristotelian approach, in essence, turns ideas and truth into God. It tempts people with an ideolatry or a worship of ideas that conflicts with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, the one who brought you out of Israel. Even if, as Newman argues, the Holy Spirit gives people the ability to contemplate the truth, and he does argue this, and therefore be able to image the mind of Christ that contemplates all things, the idolatrous temptation to rely on ideas as the real source of all good in life remains very strong in the Aristotelian approach. The second problem to point out is selfishness. The notion that knowledge is its own end, or that the contemplation of ideas is intrinsic purely for its own sake, is very nice rhetoric, but it's not entirely accurate. If it were, then a person who would pursue the truth would do this simply for the sake of the truth, regardless of how it affects him or her. But this is not how intrinsic contemplation of truth is ever talked about. Instead, contemplation is frequently described, almost always described, as a means to the end of personal happiness. Aristotle says, if a person serves others, though, it should be done to advance his own nobility, since each person, quote, is his own best friend and therefore ought to love himself best. Direct quote. Newman's approach to intellectual activity seems less self-centered than Aristotle's, since Newman holds that faith, the faith of the religious mind is instinct with love towards God and towards man. Rochi's liberal education is helping students discern their calling to serve others and themselves. Liberal education, Roach explains, helps people answer questions like this, and I quote, what do I care about most in the world? Like Newman, though, Roach's approach is largely centered on the self and holds that the communal benefits of liberal education are far less important than personally contemplating ideas. As Roach declares, Instrumental values are not the highest values in life, but are necessary if the highest values of contemplation are to be realized. So despite the talk of service, love, and vocations, the Aristotelian approach to pursuing truth ends up tempting people towards self-centeredness. It takes the goodness of truth and turns it to the happy service of the self and incidental aid for the neighbor. This reflects well the sin of homo incurvatus ense, or man turned inward on himself, that Luther so poignantly lambasts in his Romans commentary, and I quote, Our nature has been so deeply curved in upon itself because of the viciousness of original sin that it not only turns the finest gifts of God in upon itself and enjoys them, as is evident in the case of legalists and hypocrites, indeed it even uses God himself to achieve these aims, but it also seems to be ignorant of this very fact, that in acting so iniquitously, so perversely, and in such a depraved way, it is even seeking God for its own sake. 
Luther could have substituted legalism and hypocrisy with Aristotelian contemplation here, since it turns the good gift of pursuing truth toward the self-centered joy of the individual and seeks a noetic God that supports that aim. Instead of the God who created and saved humanity and nature in righteousness and grace, the intellectual idol contemplates its own thoughts and eternal happiness without condescending to trifling acts of justice and mercy for humanity. Even the incarnate Christ under Aristotelian influence becomes the consummate contemplator, the God who became human to elevate humanity to the divine perfection of being able to contemplate all truth. Now, considering the virtues and vices of the Aristotelian approach to education, is it really possible for a Christian university to preserve the good aspects of Aristotelian education? Uh, is it possible to eradicate its problems and even suffuse it with scripture's two highest ends for humanity, namely loving God and loving one's neighbors? Yes, I think it is possible. And all this is possible by shifting the theological moorings away from an Aristotelian theology of glory toward a Lutheran theology of the cross, which is where we go from here. If the Aristotelian aim transgresses with ideolatry and selfishness, the root of the problem is really its theology. Scripture reveals that God is not opposed to serving others with justice and mercy. God is not centered on seeking his own eternal happiness and contemplation apart from caring about anybody. Rather, God reveals his justice and gracious love for humanity in the righteous life, suffering, death, and resurrection of the incarnate Christ. As Luther declaims in his 1518 Heidelberg Dis Disputation, true theology and recognition of God are in the crucified Christ. Based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, Luther categorizes all theologies as falling into just two contrary camps. A theology of glory that calls evil good and good evil, and a theology of the cross that calls the thing exactly what it is. A theology of glory willfully and blindfully desires to gain knowledge, wisdom, virtue, and the like to achieve its own divine glory, but it can never hope to attain this due to human sin. A theology of the cross, on the other hand, reveals Christ, who is, as Luther says, just and has fulfilled all the commandments of God for humanity which people graciously receive in faith. Moreover, Christ lives in people through faith and, as Luther says, arouses them to do good works through that living faith in his work by which he has saved them. Aristotle Luther levels, his, Aristotle's philosophy Luther levels is, quote, contrary to a theology of the cross, since in all things it seeks those things which are its own, namely its own good works, and receives rather than gives something good. It is a theology of glory that seeks its own good and immortality by arrogantly trusting in its own works, like knowledge and wisdom, but can never achieve them due to sin. This is the opposite of a theology of the cross where the love of God, rather than seeking its own good, flows and bestows good on others. As Luther says, it turns in the direction where it does not find good, where it may enjoy, but it turns where it may confer good upon the bad and needy person. The cross of Christ does not serve itself, simply stated. The love of God in the crucified Christ serves humanity by delivering people from the law, death, and the sinful folly of false idols like ideolatry and self-centeredness. It reforms life's highest ends by delivering people through Christ's loving acts uh, for them and arousing in them a faith-filled response to love, serve, and bestow good on their neighbors. This freedom turns liberal education away from Aristotle's freedom, which again is liberty from others for self-service, and it turns it away from Aristotle's understanding of liberty to a truly liberated education where individual freedom is used to serve the neighbor. This reformation of liberal education is wonderfully and succinctly expounded by Luther in his 1520 treatise, The Freedom of a Christian. In explaining how salvation in Christ removes the need to strive after good works to earn salvation and consequently frees people for a life of faith, active, and love, Luther declares the following. God has given me in Christ all the riches of righteousness and salvation without any merit on my part out of pure free mercy, so that from now on 
I need nothing except faith which believes that this is true. Why should I not therefore freely, joyfully, with all my heart and with an eager will do all things which I know are pleasing and acceptable to such a father who has overwhelmed me with his inestimable gifts? I will therefore give myself as a Christ to my neighbor, just as Christ offered himself to me. I will do nothing in this life except what I see is necessary, profitable, and salutary to my neighbor, since through faith I have an abundance of all good things in Christ in Christ. He concludes, the work of all colleges, monasteries, and all priests should be of this nature. Applying a theology of the cross to higher education not only supports the good gifts of liberal education, it also corrects the Aristotelian temptations to idolatry and incorvatus ense. By reorienting higher education's highest ends toward a vision of faith in God of the cross, and a mission of love towards one's neighbor. A theology of the cross affirms that each person, mind, body, and soul, is, is a distinctly good end in God's eyes, and that every individual should seek her own good. However, this is accomplished passively. It's accomplished passively at the cross of Christ, where in faith a person freely receives God's goodness and justice and mercy through what Christ has done. Stirred by the love of God in Christ, the individual, the saint here, not sinner, no longer seeks leisure, freedom, knowledge, wisdom, truth, or virtue for its own sake first. Instead, the individual receives, enjoys, and cultivates them as God's good gifts, but does so ultimately for others. Indeed, as Paul exhorts us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, to think on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, so Paul also exhorts us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, not to seek our own good, but the good of our neighbors, principally when it comes to salvation. In this cruciform vision, the primary purpose of higher education is twofold. First, to know and trust in God as he has revealed himself in the cross of Christ. And two, being aroused by God's love to use the pursuit of truth the development of intellectual habits, the cultivation of virtues, academic liberty, and every good gift of higher education to bestow good on one's neighbors for their temporal and eternal welfare. At the foot of the cross, the idol of contemplation and the self are crushed by Christ and raised to a new life in faith toward God and loving service toward the neighbor. This is the theology that should shape the humanity's purpose in life and it should shape the highest end of higher education as well, especially at a Lutheran Christian university. With this answer, the question I submit now becomes, what does a university under the cross of Christ completely look like, and how do we make that a reality? How should a cruciform approach shape and interact with academic programs, with classes, co- and extracurricular activities, and residential life, how should it inform and reform the vocations of faculty, administrators, students, staff, regents, and everything else that constitutes the modern university today? I offer no answers at this point, as that would go well beyond the scope of this lecture and my allotted time, which I want to be sensitive to. Instead, I close with the insight and encouragement of Philip Melanchthon. It's the insight and encouragement that he left his audience with in his inaugural address at Wittenberg University in 1518, when he was talking on the need and vision for reforming university education. Here's what he says. It remains, it remains then, ladies and gentlemen, that you hear that no matter what the situation, and mind you, what is beautiful to imagine may be difficult to achieve, remember, industry conquers difficulty. Thank you. <laughs>